uh, okay, so uh, so welcome back. And um, so as, as, as you saw in the previous part, uh, we've sort of created a mess here where we find that the first order approximation gives us a minus three equal to zero. And, um, and the only place where we could have wrong, could have gone wrong is in making this uh, assumption for our solution that it, it's of the form x naught plus x one epsilon. So, uh, so now we need to figure out how to sort of um, resolve this, 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 this dilemma we are in. Um, uh, so, so let's introduce a couple of new um, ideas before we proceed to see what exactly went wrong. And so, um, and these sort of are uh, sort of the, the, these are again two notions which are uh, used quite often in the study of um, what is in, 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 the, in the study of perturbation methods, and these are sometimes called asymptotic relations. Um, so let's asymptotic relations. Okay, so again, these are relations between functions, just like uh, the big O was a relation between two functions that we talked about in a previous video. Uh, so, so we just need to talk about two such relations for now. Um, so one is um, given a function fx, we say that the function fx is much, much less than another function gx in the limit that x goes to x naught. This is true if modulus of fx divided by gx uh, in the limit x goes to x naught is 0. Right. So all this says is that as we approach x naught, uh, the function fx is much, much smaller than the function gx. So that's one relation. Uh, the other relation is denoted by the symbol this. And this is sometimes um, uh, referred to as fx scales as gx or fx is asymptotic to gx. Uh, in, again, in the limit that x goes to x naught, if um, limit x goes to x naught, modulus of fx divided by gx is 1. So this means that both fx and gx are comparable to each other in the limit that x goes to x naught. Um, so, so, so these two uh, relations are something that we now um, we, we now use. Um, uh, so, um, in, 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 so, so okay. So, so, so let's see how it sort of enters into our discussion so far. So, um, so now here uh, when we started off with this quadratic equation, we made an assumption that the solution and solution exists in the form of x naught plus x one epsilon to the power of one plus higher order powers of epsilon, which we ignored for now. And uh, this says that x, the solution, uh, apart from the zeroth order term, the first order solution scales as epsilon to the power of one, which means it goes. So we can say that the x one order solution, x uh, or, the, or the first order term, scales as epsilon. And it's possible that there's something wrong in this assumption that we're making. Um, now, in order to see, uh, there is a sort of a procedure uh, that given an equation, um, we can figure out, we, we, we should try and figure out which terms appearing in the equation are dominant and which are smaller than the other terms and therefore can be dropped. So what does this mean? So, so there is a technical name for this method, and it's called the method of dominant balance. And um, and this is something which is extremely useful, uh, especially when we start studying singular perturbation methods. And it's very important, and and therefore it's uh, interesting and actually very useful to study it in the context of this equation first, because it will bring out all the ideas and concepts, um, which are, which 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 as as we'll see appear again and again uh, in in perturbation uh, theory. So. So let's talk about what is called the method of dominant balance. <clears throat> so it's called method of dominant balance. 
balance. Okay. So the key idea here is here is um, given an equation, uh, try and identify a pair of terms uh, that in the limit that we are interested in, which is most often when epsilon goes to zero. So in the limit that epsilon goes to zero, try and identify a pair of terms which are comparable, which means um, as a function of epsilon, um, or, or actually the, the whole term, um, we will just see how this works. Two terms which are comparable to each other and are much, much greater than other terms appearing in the equation. And these two terms are called the dominant pairs in the equation. Um, once we are able to identify these terms, um, we'll find we, we'll be able to see what is actually the structure of the perturbation series that one should use um, as, as our assumption for the solution of the equation. Uh, and by structure we mean the powers of epsilon that has that have to appear in the perturbative series expansion. So uh, so it's best I think to try it out on this equation just to uh, reveal what these ideas are. Um, so so this equation has uh, a priori it has like these three terms um, but because there's a one plus epsilon and one minus epsilon it's it's useful to sort of recast this equation in a way uh, that's much simpler to deal with so so let's do that first um, so let's take this equation and let's get rid of this part for now because okay Now this equation, uh, we can collect this term and this term and this an x square term together and write it in the form x square minus 2x plus 1 and then we have minus 2 epsilon x minus 2 epsilon x minus epsilon so plus epsilon equals 0. Now this uh, can be written as x minus 1 whole square and then we can take the epsilon factor out minus epsilon 2x plus 1 equals 0 and we can simplify this a little more by defining a new variable let's just call it y is x minus 1 and in terms of y we can write this equation as y square minus epsilon uh, if y is x minus 1, then x is y plus 1. So this will give us 2y um, plus 3 equals 0. Or in other words, um, y square minus 2y epsilon minus 3 epsilon is 0. So let's take this to be our working equation and try and see what the method of dominant balance is. Now, uh, if you if you look at this equation uh, as, as as a naive approximation, we see that we have a term which is two y epsilon and a term three epsilon, and and if epsilon is so small, like zero point zero 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 two, we might be tempted to say that okay, these two terms are actually very small, so let's just drop them, uh, and this will give us y equals zero, which means x equals one. Uh, it'll have double roots, y equals zero comma zero, and therefore x equals one comma one, uh, which is what we had earlier. But, but obviously there's something wrong here because uh, as we saw that leads us into a, to the first order term which gives us minus 3 equal to 0. So uh, so it's possible that actually these two, uh, dropping these two terms is not quite correct. Um, and, 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 and now our goal is to identify a pair of terms in this equation which is actually dominant which will leave us with one term which is insignificant compared to those two terms and this will give us the structure of the perturbation series that we should actually end up using. So uh, so now if you so there are three terms so therefore there are three possibilities for the pairs of terms which could be dominant um, and, and by pairs of terms which are dominant which means we we have two terms which are asymptotic scale or rather scale uh, scale uh, are asymptotic to each other and a third term which is much smaller than those two terms. So, so let's see uh, how we identify such a pair of terms. So as a first guess, uh, let's try, um, let's try uh, that 2y epsilon uh, is 
asymptotic to 3 epsilon. What will this uh, assumption give us? So, so we are assuming that these two are dominant and this is small. Okay, so this will give us 2y epsilon is asymptotic to 3 epsilon. Let's say that this is true. Now, when we have this asymptotic relation, we will work with it as if it was an equation, like an ordinary equation. And if we have some common factors, we can get rid of them. And, and of course, these numerical factors don't really matter because uh, we can sort of say that they are order one, order of magnitude is one, more or less, in this case. Uh, and so, so what's, what we're really interested in is, is in the behavior of the function in this case and not so much on the particular numerical factor that's appearing here. So uh, if this is true, then if we cancel the epsilon out, we find that y scales as 1. Okay, so let's say this were true. Then what is the order of all the three terms that is appearing in this equation? So the first term is y squared. If y is y scales as 1, then y squared also scales as 1. Okay. The second term is y 2y epsilon. Uh, and this will scale as y scales as 1. So this scales as epsilon. Again, the numerical factor 2 is not so important. Um, and the third term is 3 epsilon, which scales as epsilon. So this tells us that terms 2 and 3 which is how we got this relation that y is of the order of 1, um, scale as epsilon, whereas the first term scales as 1. So in the limit that epsilon goes to 0, and of course all this is in the limit that epsilon goes to 0. Now in the limit that epsilon goes to 0, these two terms are actually much smaller than y square. And so these two cannot be the dominant terms of the equation, even though they scale similarly, they are not the dominant terms of the equation because the dominant term then is y square equals Y, the dominant term is y square. Um, so, so, so this assumption is not quite consistent because we because we're looking for a pair of terms which balance each other, and that's why it's called method of dominant balance. And a third term which is much smaller than those two pairs. Um, so, so let's um, let's look for another guess. So this guess doesn't work. So the other guess is. Um, so these two terms are not dominant. The other guess is that these two terms are dominant and this is not important. So let's try that out. So we are saying that y square scales as y epsilon. Okay. Uh, so again, we can get rid of the y here and this square here. So this says that y scales as epsilon. So let's see what is the order of all the three terms that are appearing now. So the first term y square would then scale as epsilon square. The second term y 2y epsilon would scale as epsilon square again because y scales as epsilon so epsilon times epsilon scales as epsilon square whereas the third term 3 epsilon scales as epsilon. Now again in the limit that epsilon is going to 0 we find we find that the third term is actually dominant because then epsilon is much, much greater than epsilon squared in the limit that epsilon is very small. And so the first and the second term, even though this, they, they balance each other, they are not the dominant terms of the equation. We are, we are looking for two terms which, are, which balance each other and are dominant. So this assumption is also not quite correct. And that leaves us with the third um, balance of a third, third, third pair of terms. Um, which is y squared balances 3 epsilon. So let's see what that gives us. So if y squared scales as epsilon, then y scales as epsilon to the power of half. Okay, so let's look at all the three terms again. So the first term y squared would scale as epsilon. The second term is 2y epsilon that will scale as y scales as epsilon to the power of half. So epsilon to the power of half times epsilon is epsilon to the power of 3 half. And the third term, 3 epsilon scales as epsilon. Now this is good because the first term and the third term both balance each other 
which is what we were looking for, and this scale as epsilon. And equally important is that both these terms are actually much greater than epsilon to the power of 3 half in the limit that epsilon goes to 0, because in that limit, epsilon is much, much greater than epsilon to the power of 3 half. So this assumption is a consistent assumption, uh, is a consistent assumption to make, which is that these two are actually the dominant terms, whereas this one is insignificant compa in comparison to those two. Okay, so, so this gives us what is called the structure of the perturbation series, because what this relation tells us is that y, our variable or the solution, uh, we are looking for, we are now looking for a solution in terms of y, y should scale as epsilon to the power of half and not in powers of epsilon to the power of 1 which is the assumption that we were making initially um, and so so now we have to use this scaling relation to develop a perturbation series and then see um, and then sort of solve for uh, the coefficients of that perturbation series uh, so, so, so let's now build on this method and see how to use it um, to find the roots of the equation. Okay, so see you in the next part. Thanks.